Hi there everyone. In this video, I'm going to tell you a little story about a story. More specifically, the story, the book, behind the 1976 Clint Eastwood film, The Outlaw Josie Wales. The way that it came to be written is one of the most interesting stories uh, in all of movie history that I've ever heard. It's unbelievable and scandalous and thought-provoking and all the things that a good story should be. As good as the story of this film and book may be, it doesn't hold a candle to the story behind the story itself, to how this story was conceived, of who wrote the story, of how it was written. It is so interesting, I promise. But before getting into any of that, let's go over the actual story of the film. The film takes place in the later years of the American Civil War in the South. Our protagonist, named Josie Wales, played by Clint Eastwood, is a peaceful man. All he wants to do is take care of his wife and son, his home, tend to his crops, grow his farm, away from all of the horrors of war. You know the drill. But soon after the beginning of the film, some Union soldiers, some federal government boys, you know, the boys from the North, they ride into his farm. They burn down his house, they kill his wife, and they even kill his young child. Josie Wales survives, though, and he does what any man in his situation would do. He seeks revenge. He joins the war. He joins a group of southern soldiers who are guerrilla warfighters. They're not the normal army of the South. They're a special group that goes out and ambushes and sabotages. You know, they're guerrilla fighters. He joins them and fights throughout the war. But after a while, the Civil War comes to an end. The greater southern army, by this point, has surrendered to the Union. But the group that Josie Wales has joined, the guerrilla fighters who are behind enemy lines causing all sorts of trouble, they haven't surrendered yet. They're still wreaking havoc. But the leader of Josie Wales' group, Fletcher uh, is his name, he convinces his group that it's time that they lay down their weapons and surrender. So the group of guerrilla fighters show up to a Union camp, prepared to surrender. Josie Wales, though, doesn't want to surrender. To him, the war is not over. The war will never be over. Again, think of what those Union soldiers did to his family. So, while Fletcher and the rest of his group march down to the Union camp to surrender, Josie Wales watches from afar. And what do you know? It's a trap. All of Josie's friends are gunned down by a firing squad after handing over their weapons. All of them except Fletcher. Fletcher is seen to be buddy buddies with the senators, with the leaders of the Union, with the federal government. He was the one who convinced his men to surrender. He didn't know that his men were going to be killed, but either way, he is the one who convinced his men to give up in exchange for money and freedom. He betrayed his men. But after watching this, Josie tries to stop it. He attacks the camp and he kills as many Union soldiers as he can, but eventually he has to retreat. He is very outnumbered. The Union boys and Fletcher chase after Josie Wales. He gets away after the shootout, but still, for the rest of the movie, he is an outlaw being pursued by the federal government, by the Northerners. Throughout the movie, Josie has to pretend to be someone else, disguising himself as anyone but the now infamous outlaw Josie Wales. Eventually, Josie makes his way into Native American territory. It's territory that, in theory, isn't under the control of the federal government. Josie ends up befriending an old Native American man, and he ends up really taking a liking to the Native American culture. He sees himself as having a lot in common with the Native American, as they belong to groups that are both persecuted by the federal government. He immerses himself so deeply into the Native American culture that he even becomes blood brothers with a tribal leader. And while he may get in many shootouts throughout the movie and all sorts of action and violence occurs, by the end of the movie, he is sick of running, sick of fighting. Even though he had a good reason to take part in the war, to avenge his family, it's now reached a point where it's no longer worth it to him. He sees the futility of war. He sees the pointlessness of letting all of his painful memories from the past control his actions in the present. He eventually realizes he needs to become a different man. He changes his name, joins a different culture, and he does just that. He becomes a new man and washes away the sins of his past. The film The Outlaw Josie Wales has a good story. 
It's a story that everyone can love. It's about letting go of revenge and violent causes. It's, it's anti-war and it's anti-authority. I mean, everyone has nice things to say about the message of this movie. Conservatives could like it for the, you know, anti-federal government thing, or God forbid, the lost cause rewriting the history of the Civil War, you know, states' rights, you know, for, for that reason. But then liberals, people on the left in America, they also like this movie too, because it's pro-human rights, kind of. I mean, it's fighting against an authority that is evil, that mistreats people. And also, this was one of the first movies that actually humanized Native Americans. Normally, Native American characters were just these stoic, you know, stereotypes. The Native American characters in this film were actually characters. They had different personalities, they had dreams and memories and, 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 and feelings. There was something for everyone to love in this movie, which is why it became such a big hit. After the movie came out, people noticed that in the credits it said it was based off of a book. So, naturally, they looked into the book. Before the movie came out, no one had really ever heard of it. It really was just a crazy coincidence that one of Clint Eastwood's producers happened to read the book. I mean, only a few copies of it were printed. Like, this guy, the writer of this book, was a nobody. But after the movie came out, all of a sudden, everyone wanted to know about the author, Forrest Carter. Who was this Forrest Carter? How could a writer this good? Because yes, the book was really good. The book was just as good as the movie, if not better. He was an amazing writer. How could a writer this good have gone so long without being discovered? By the time this movie came out, I mean, he was old. I mean, where has he been all these years? What has he been doing? With this new fame thrust onto him, Forrest Carter decided to write an autobiography. If people were so curious about who he was and where he came from, he would write another book explaining it to them. The Education of Little Tree, his autobiography, hit the shelves and was immediately a massive success. Every person who read it was struck by how powerful and important this man's autobiography was. It tells how Forrest was born on a reservation, how his parents were killed, how he had to live with his grandparents until he was the age of 10 and then they also were killed, how he was homeless and scavenging and just trying to survive from such a young age all on his own. And somehow little Forrest defied this adversity and was able to become a successful writer telling great stories about his people. The book was a triumph, an inspiration. All of the country, all of Hollywood, all of the media came to adore. Forrest Carter. But sadly, just three years later, in 1979, Forrest died. His funeral was attended by crowds and crowds of the most powerful people in Hollywood. Thousands paid their respects. But, hours later, after everyone had cleared the graveyard, another group of people showed up. People from the American South that no one really knew. They went over to Forrest's grave and paid respects of their own. They had a second funeral for him. As if two different people were dead in the same grave. Eventually, the original headstone that said Forrest Carter was taken away and was replaced by one that said Asa Carter. As it turns out, Forrest Carter wasn't Native American at all. His autobiography had been a complete lie. His name had been a lie. His entire identity was fabricated just a few years before his death. Forrest Carter never really existed. So who was this man that wrote all of these great stories? What's his real backstory? Well, this was shown to the public, or at least some of the public. This really isn't that well known of a story. This was shown in a Times article called The Transformation of a Klansman. That's right. The writer of these books that tell a wonderful story about accepting other cultures and getting along and singing Kumbaya, this man, whose real name was Asa Carter, was a Klansman. In the mid-50s, Asa Carter worked at radio stations in Birmingham. His shows were sponsored by the American States Rights Association. He was syndicated to over 20 radio stations, and he got a taste for having a following. Carter founded a group known as the North Alabama Citizens Council. Carter founded a paramilitary KKK splinter group called the original Ku Klux Klan of the Confederacy. He started a monthly publication called The Southerner, which was completely devoted to the idea that the white race was superior. In 1956, Six members of Carter's new KKK group attacked the singer Nat King Cole at a Birmingham concert. They also attacked and abducted a black handyman named Judge Aaron. 
They castrated Aaron, poured turpentine on his wounds, and left him in a trunk to die. Luckily, Aaron lived. But unluckily, Carter got away with it. A few of the members in his group were sentenced to 20 years in prison, but Carter got away with it because the parole board was appointed by Carter's then-employer, George Wallace. That's right. Asa Carter was working for George Wallace, the man who has become the face of segregation. As it turns out, Asa Carter wrote all of the speeches for George Wallace. He was the reason that George Wallace got elected. When he started writing speeches for George Wallace, Wallace wasn't even that racist. I mean, sure, he was certainly racist, but he wasn't saying things like segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Carter is the one who put those words in Wallace's mouth. Wallace found a lot of success with it because there were a lot of racist people back then. Of course, they wanted to elect him, but all of the ideas were Carter's. Like before, with his radio stations, Carter found a new way to spread his words of hate, but this time through the mouth of the governor of his state. George Wallace was hugely popular. For as much as he was hated by some of the country, he was loved by others. So he decided to take a run at the presidency in 1968. Except by this point, it was 1968. The country was changing. George Wallace knew that he couldn't keep up the segregation, the racist, all that stuff. He needed to be more of a centrist. So he fired Asa Carter as his speechwriter. He had no use for Asa's sort of rhetoric. Wallace distanced himself from Carter, even going so far as to deny that the man ever worked for him. Asa Carter saw this as a massive betrayal. Not only did George Wallace betray him, his friend, but he also betrayed the cause. He was going to be a centrist? He was going to let black people come into the schools? He was going to allow this race mixing? Carter became disillusioned with his former boss. In fact, in 1970, after Wallace, you know, obviously didn't win presidency, Carter ran against Wallace for the governor of Alabama, running, of course, on a white supremacist platform. Thankfully, Carter finished in last place out of five candidates. It was a horrific defeat. Carter realized that at this point, the country had changed. White supremacy was certainly alive and well, but it wasn't nearly as widespread as it used to be. He just didn't have the support that he used to have. So, he quit. He disappeared from the public eye and never appeared again. That is, until the country saw him on the TV being interviewed by Barbara Walters, pretending to be a Native American six years later, but <laughs> that didn't come out until after his death. Because yes, he moved out into the country with his family, he changed his name to Forrest, named after Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, the general in the Confederate Army who fought in the Civil War and was the first leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Fun fact, also who Forrest Gump was named after, and then started writing Western novels. He became a completely different person. He got really, really tan, so he could tell everyone that he was half Native American. He wore a hat and eccentric clothing and grew a mustache and made all sorts of friends in his new community. He pretended to be a liberal. He pretended to be this hippie, and everyone around him fell in love with him. It worked. But remember, who he was at his core was a writer. And in 1972, just two years after losing to George Wallace in the governor race, he published his first book, The Rebel Outlaw, Josie Wales. The story of the rebel outlaw Josie Wales is a parable for how Asa Carter views his own life. Asa Carter used the Civil War to represent the culture war that was happening in the late 50s and 60s. He used the character of Josie Wales to represent himself, or maybe white men in general. The federal government had came in, and with their actions, the family was destroyed. So he had no choice but to fight back against this enemy, to wage war against them. But the North, the Union, the Feds, they won. And all of his former friends that were so pro-segregation were forced to surrender. They were forced to give in to the changing political tides of the nation. And remember, when Josie Wales' group surrenders, they are betrayed by one of their own, by their leader. In the story of the book, this is Fletcher, but in real life, I'm pretty confident he's George Wallace. Josie Wales, just like Asa, is the only man who doesn't give in, who doesn't surrender. He escapes the wrath of the federal government. He becomes a man on the run, a man who is wanted, who's hunted. A man who's forced to take on a new identity to become a different person. A man who allies himself with the Native Americans, immersing himself in their culture. He gives up on the great culture war that he was involved in. He gives up on the Civil War. He lets it go, and he becomes someone else. 
It's not a story that preaches acceptance and forgiveness. It was a way for Asa Carter to rationalize his own history. It was a way for him to tell his story of fleeing the battlefield and camouflaging himself in the Native American culture. It was the only way he could admit that he did that because he could never actually tell his real story. He had to use an allegory. His real story was kind of incredible. I mean, as evil as it was, it was interesting. It's just something that he could never admit. So he wrote a book to admit it. He probably wasn't counting on the book blowing up and making him a celebrity, which is eventually what led to, you know, him being discovered. But still, God, wow. Is anyone else out there like as blown away as I am by the story or am I the only one? It's a story that makes me think of all sorts of different things. Even philosophical things like identity, like who are we really? Are we our past? Are we our actions? Are we in control of any of it? Can we really change? I'm forced to ask myself things like that because when Asa Carter became Forrest Carter, it's like he really became him. For years, the new friends that he made had no idea who he was. He pretended to be this liberal hippie, and they loved him for it. I mean, remember, he did go on to write a autobiography about his time being a Native American, and yes, that was all a lie. It was all just self-defense. It was all a way of making sure he was never found out. But still, the book made a huge impact on America. It touched millions of people. In fact, the entire category that's known as Native American literature was spawned out of this book. This book was a huge step forward for Native Americans. Forrest Carter kind of helped Native Americans quite a bit. Like, he was full of shit, and he was an evil man, and he was using them for his own purposes, but at the end of the day, he did kind of bring awareness to a lot of things that most Americans weren't aware of. He may have spent his entire early career just dehumanizing and persecuting an entire minority of people, but then later on, he did the opposite. I'm not saying he did all of this as an act of redemption. I'm not saying that he chose to do the right thing, to clear his conscience, to make up for all the evil he had done in his past. But I'm also not saying that he didn't do that, because there really isn't a way to know. He died in 1979 before the story of him being a phony could ever blow up. There's no way to know what he actually thought. Maybe he wasn't thinking or doing anything. Maybe he was just a shell of a man chasing after power and fortune and fame. Maybe he didn't really believe anything. Maybe he only spouted racism because there were millions of racists that wanted to hear it. This is a story of a man who wanted to get his words out by any means necessary. If hatred and bigotry were the path to fortune and fame, he would do it. If love and tolerance and acceptance were the path, he'd do that as well. For as disgusting as it is, it's pretty goddamn impressive. It's an interesting story. It is not a story about a good person. It is not a story that is happy or uplifting or wholesome or progressive or any of those good things. But it is interesting. Or at least I think it's interesting. So... Hopefully you did too. I mean, if you're this far into the video, then I'm sure you did. So, uh, okay. I didn't write a script for any of this. This was all like just kind of just off the top of my head. So I'm sorry if it's bad. Like, subscribe, share the video, all that bullshit. Okay, thanks. Bye.